This morning, our scripture lesson is in the New Testament, and you'll find it on page 188 in your New Testament Bible. It's Colossians chapter 1, verses 17, 15 through 23. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For him, all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might, might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil things, he has now reconciled in his fleshy body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. May God add his blessing to this holy word. Thanks be to God. And thank you, Lori. Will you pray with me, please? God, we pray you would bless us now as we consider in uh, the book of Colossians. We pray you would help us to understand this book and Paul's writing better. We pray you would help us to apply it to our lives. And Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations that are upon each one of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, we're still in the book of Colossians, and I would encourage you to read through it, to get familiar with it if you haven't done that. Today, we're going to go through this section, uh, 1 Colossians uh, 1, chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. But I'm going to start um, in some place kind of different. Uh, most of you know that I'm in Rotary, and I've been in Rotary now for a couple of years. One of the things that I do as a Rotarian is I am part of the Rotary Youth Exchange Committee. And so what we do is we make sure that uh, people from this community, high schoolers, go and uh, spend time abroad. And it's a great experience. And then uh, we also have students that come from all over the world and come here to Fort Bragg and spend time. The purpose of Rotary Youth International and Youth Exchange is to promote peace and understanding between peoples and nations. And it is so needed right now. So uh, I really enjoy doing that. I'm what's called the outbound counselor. So we've got uh, Sam Perkins, who's being ready to go to Switzerland in August. And Sam and I have been talking. And while he's away, Sam and I will uh, continue to, to connect with one another just to make sure things are going well. I share that story because uh, we just got back our last <coughs> exchange student. This is Gabriel Geiger. Gabriel is a student at Mendocino High. And Gabriel has spent the last year, almost, in Copenhagen, Denmark, as well as other places in Europe, uh, again, trying to learn about this world in which we live and promote peace and understanding. And so Gabriel uh, was our speaker at Rotary this past Wednesday. And I had the, the, the honor of hosting Gabriel, got to get lunch for him and do all that great stuff. And then Gabriel got up and spoke and did about a 20-minute presentation about his experiences in uh, Denmark and really throughout Europe. But we have a, a bulletin that comes to us every week before that Wednesday meeting. And that bulletin tells us what's going to happen or who's going to do a presentation. And so when uh, the person who did the bulletin found out that Gabriel was coming to speak, he said, you know, I don't know much about Gabriel. Can you provide a bio sketch? So I contacted Gabriel, and he contacted the guy who does the bulletin and then came up with this nice little thing that uh, says a little bit about who Gabriel is so that folks like Rick and others, when they would come on a Wednesday, would know a little bit about our speaker before he shows up. 
So today, Dan Fowler will introduce our returning RYE student, Gabriel Geiger, born in Los Angeles, where he lived until the age of two. After that, he moved to Mendocino, goes on and on and on, talks about Gabriel, and gives a bio sketch as to who he was. Now I'm going to tie that back to the scripture. <laughs> The reason I share this story about Gabriel is because today's passage, in effect, is very much like a bio sketch. Uh, but rather than it being about someone like a, an exchange student like Gabriel, it happens to be about Jesus Christ. And rather than going to a, a, a rotary club, this passage is sent to a church that is brand new. A church that doesn't know much about who Jesus is. And so, this passage today, in effect, is a bio sketch. And it tells this congregation in Colossae who Jesus is and what he does and what he's about. So today, we're going to take a look at this very passage and try and understand just what this passage says about Jesus and what it means for us as a congregation. Now, we think that, as I mentioned last week, Epaphras, he was the guy who founded that church in Colossae. And Epaphras, from what we can tell, was there with Paul when Paul was writing the letter. So basically, Epaphras was, was saying to Paul, you know, these are the issues in this church. Can you write about those? And so today's section is Paul saying, okay, you want to know who Jesus is because you don't know? Boom, here it is. The other thing that's interesting, particularly about verses 15 through 20, is that we think that this was either a fragment of a hymn or, more likely, a part of an old liturgy from the first century. Something like a statement of faith, like we're going to be doing in just a little bit. So that those congregations, as they gathered, would be able to say, oh, who's Jesus? Here's who Jesus is. And so whether or not Paul wrote this himself, or he said, you know, here's this great fragment right here, and I'm just going to stick it right in there, and it's going to tell you who Jesus is. Whether or not Paul did that, the main point was to find out who Jesus is and what he does and what he means. So today, that's what we're going to look at, verses 15 through 23 of Colossians chapter 1. You're welcome to, to follow along in your pew Bibles as we talk about the different things that Jesus is or that Jesus does. So, who is Jesus? Well, first, he's the image of the invisible God. That's what starts in verse 15. Now, the phrase, the invisible God, suggests that at times, God can feel remote to us. At times, God can seem distant, but here Paul says Jesus is the image of of God. We can know God through Christ. Fourth century bishop of Milan, St. Ambrose, wrote, as the print of the seal on the wax is the express image of the seal itself, so Christ is the express image, the perfect representation of God. Christ reveals the nature of God to us and is the key to a genuine understanding of the creator of all things. What else does this passage tell us about Jesus? Paul says he is the firstborn of all creation. Firstborn expresses supremacy and priority. This suggests that the Son of God was born before any other humans were created. Firstborn in the Old Testament also refers to the ranking of sons in a family. Firstborn means that Jesus ranks above all others. And John chapter 1, verse 1, expresses this as well. In the beginning was the Word, that is, Christ Jesus. And the Word was with God. He was in the beginning with God. What else does Paul tell us about Jesus? For in him all things in heaven and earth were created. Jesus was, in effect, a co-creator with God. Again, John chapter 1 says, All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. The world was created in, through, and for the Son. The next thing Paul says is kind of a, a repeat. Christ is before all things. 
This is reaffirming that Jesus is firstborn of all creation. And next comes, I think, a very uh, important aspect of Jesus. Paul says, all things hold together through him. Jesus Christ is the glue for our lives when they are falling apart. He is the one who has redeemed us, made us right in God's eyes. He is the one who teaches us how to live and act in a fallen world. He is the one who helps us when asked, and who has given us a place eternal in the heavens through his resurrection. Jesus Christ is also head of the body, the church. Christ is present when we gather, and when churches all over the world gather together. And the idea behind the concept is really simple. Our minds lead our bodies. So, if I come out in front of you and jump up and down, it's because my mind, my head, wanted to do that, and my body followed. That's what it means that Jesus is head of the church, and we are his body. Next, it says that Jesus is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Christ is the one who beat death when he arose. Christ's resurrection prepares the way for others to follow, giving us the hope of heaven so that he might come to have first place in everything. Christ's resurrection places him above all others. Next, in Christ we read, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. This reemphasizes that we can know God through Jesus as fully as possible for mortals such as ourselves. What else does this passage tell us about Jesus? It says, God reconciled us through Christ's sacrifice and made peace with all creation. Jesus' sacrifice reunites everyone and everything with God. The entire world was reaffirmed. Creation was restored, healing its disturbed relationship with its creator. So that ends that little fragment, verses 15 through 20. Then verses 21 through 22 are a little addendum, if you will, giving the believer a practical application of what Jesus' bio sketch provides. Verse 21 begins, You who were once estranged. Sin separates us. Separates us from God. Separates us from one another. Separates us from this creation which God has made. And Christ has reconciled us through death on the cross. We are made righteous before God through Christ's sacrifice. And this is something we could never have done upon our own. It is precisely through his death on the cross that we are made holy and blameless in God's eyes. That we are reconciled to God and to one another. So then, to sum up this bio sketch, God decisively revealed God's self and acted through the Son who died and rose again as the Messiah, but who also was existent before all things. Theologian David M. May writes, The writer employs an early church hymn to draw its readers into a foundational confession that in Jesus, humanity and all of creation have been given their clearest image of God. And in Jesus' death and resurrection, the basis for universal peace and hope. And that brings us to verse 23. And if you just don't listen a lot, you might have missed it, but it's kind of one of the most important verses in the whole passage. It says, if or provided. Provided or if you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel which you have heard. All the stuff that's come before, verses 15 through 22, they're conditional. All of these things about Jesus are true for us if we continue in the faith and hope in the gospel. What is the specific hope? As David May summed it up, that in Jesus, humanity and all of creation have been given their clearest image of God, and in Jesus' death and resurrection, the basis for universal peace and hope. This is key for today. 
especially in light of yet more horrific news of yet another terrorist attack. In Nice, scores of innocent men, women, teens, and children were killed by a madman in a truck who may or may not have had ties to ISIS. Yet again, we see the images and hear the stories of spectators, and we are shaken to our core. Why does such evil exist? Why do some claim the name of God when they kill in cold blood? What is happening to our world? Where is God in all of this? It is difficult to hold on to faith in times such as these, and perhaps much easier to place our hopes in warfare and revenge. If somehow we can wipe out ISIS and all those who support this evil network of terror, peace will be known once more in our world. And yet the psalmist writes, the war horse is a vain hope for victory, and by its great might it cannot save. Psalm 33, 17. When we put our faith and hope in such things, we lose the basis for universal hope and peace. We lose Jesus Christ. Theologian Anne Lamott wrote the following paragraphs on her Facebook page yesterday. She said, life has always been this scary here, and we have always been as vulnerable as kittens. Plagues and Visigoths, snakes and schizophrenia, Cain is still killing Abel and nature means that everyone dies. I hate this. It's too horrible for words. When my son was seven and found out that he and I would not die at the exact same second, he said, crying, if I had known this, I wouldn't have agreed to be born. <laughs> Don't you feel like that sometime? She continues, my father's mother lost a small child in the 1918 flu pandemic. Someone in the family is having a nervous breakdown. A yoga teacher was shot down at the road last year while, by some druggies while walking on a footpath. A yoga teacher. And then in recent weeks, Orlando, police shooting innocent people, innocent police officers being shot, and now Nice. How on earth do we respond when we are stunned and scared and overwhelmed to the point of almost disbelieving? There is no healing in pretending this bizarre violent stuff is not going on and that there is some cute bumper sticker silver lining. What is true is that the world has always been this way. People have always been this way. Grace always bats last. It just does. And finally, when all is said and done and the dust settles, which it does, love is sovereign here. This is not a time to lose faith in God or faith in humanity. This is a time to hold on to, to cling to Jesus Christ, who holds all things together. And through him is the basis, the basis for universal hope and peace. This is the time to show deep and abiding love for our neighbors, to show our care and concern for others. This is a time to stand up led by the power and presence of Jesus Christ in our lives to promote peace. For when all is said and done and the dust settles, love is still sovereign. Hope is still guiding us. Peace is still possible. So let us go from this place, holding on to our faith so that our light shines in the darkness letting the world know even now in such times as these that God's love is sovereign. Alleluia and amen. Let us have silence as we consider God's word for us this day.